Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Predictable Revenue live stream. So excited to have all of you guys joining us today. How's it going out there? How's everybody doing? I see we've got we've got 15 people with us already. So wonderful. Thank you for thank you for being there so promptly. I could see you guys all waiting to get in and we're so excited um, to chat to you guys. Um, I'm going to make it so that you cannot see all of the stuff on my Zoom screen if I can. Maybe I can't, and that's okay. That's okay. You can just see the little chat bar down the bottom, but that is fine. Mostly you can just see our faces, and that's good. Um, everybody, please chat as you're, as you're coming in. Jot down to us where you're from, where you're, where you're watching in from right now, and I'd also love to hear what role you're in. I'd love to hear um, where, yeah, where you guys are, where you're calling in from, what you do all day. Yeah. yeah. Basically, Sarah's asking, what's your name? What's your sign? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So excited to have you guys here. While you're all trickling in, yeah, let us know where you're from, what's your role, are you SDRs, are you SDR managers, are you AEs, are you, you know, VP sales? Like, what what is your what is your connection to sales? Where are you Where are you located, Sarah? Texas. I, I am actually located in Vancouver, Canada, a far cry oh, yeah, from Texas. Okay. Do I, okay. like, do I like, like exude opposite. Texan to you? Is there a twang that you notice? Honestly, like a little bit. Really? Okay. Okay. Maybe it's the sleeves. It's a little bit of a like Southern Sound like a debutante. Southern yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where are you, Rajiv? I am in Chicago. So closer to Canada than yes. Texas is to Canada. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. And also probably equally as far from Texas. Well, I don't know if my geography, and maybe my geography is terrible. I don't know. I think it's probably think closer to, we're But one Texas state is kind of Canada. like in the middle and at the bottom, right? And then we're kind of yes. like this. Yes. It's still the central time zone. Yes. <laughs> right. Who knows? We've got <laughs> another Vancouver person with us, Colin Stewart, who is posing as an SDR in the chat. He's actually my boss and he's watching to see if I do the, a good job. Um, and then we've got Lee from Asheville, North Carolina. Okay, where's that up, in our Lee? little like Texas, Chicago, Vancouver triangle? Um, Kenya, yeah. Doris from Kenya. Wow, long way away. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope that it is not like the middle of the night for you, but if it is, well done. <laughs> good, excellent work ethic. We're so excited to have you here. Um, Rajiv, I think we can get going, right? I think, Let's do it. think we're Let's good to it. go. Okay, well, once again, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for a, another um, wonderful live stream. We've got a really exciting guest with us today, Rajiv Nathan or Raj Nation, as you might know him. Um, we're so excited to talk about how to not suck at your elevator pitch. That is a, a big thing that you should not suck at. You may have noticed that people, when you do your little elevator pitch on the phone or whatever, it's not getting you the response that you'd like. It may not be that you truly suck at it, but let's make sure that you aren't sucking at it. Rajiv, take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, big ups to the Predictable Revenue team for having me on. Uh, I'm super excited to teach this to y'all today. And not just today, but if you're not aware, this is part one of an awesome four-part series we've got over the next four months that we're calling the Try Not to Suck series. <laughs> so today we've got How to Not Suck Your Elevator Pitch. Next month, we're going to have uh, how to not suck at personalizing cold emails. So you'll be able to like take the information from today, and then we're going to look at, all right, how do you take that and apply it to a cold email strategy where you want to use personalization? Then we're going to advance the month after that. I think that's August at that point, talking about uh, demo calls that don't suck. And then the following month in September, we cap off the four-part series with sales presentations that don't suck. So I'm excited for all y'all who are here today, and I hope to see you back in our future workshops as well. So let's get started with how to not suck at your elevator pitch. Well, I know this is probably on a lot of your mind, especially if you're here right now. Um, overall, this is, a, um, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, because I'll get a lot of people who will come up to me, you know, and I'll be like, oh, like, you know, like, what's your pitch? And they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm not, wasn't really prepared. And I'm like, well, you know, what never happens is someone walking up to you, like your customer walking up to you and being like, hey, not today, but tomorrow at this time, I'm going to come back and I want to hear how you talk about your company then. But like, I'm going to give you that 24 hour heads up, right? That never happens. Like you got to be prepared. You got to know what's going on, like on the spot and have something you can deliver. And it's not just that it's gonna be like what you say in that kind of interaction, 
it's also going to be like the you'll you'll find out as we go forward it's going to be very much the foundation of your entire messaging strategy so with that let's go ahead and begin and i want to open here with a game show that i like to call pitch your product that's right it's pitch your product the only live interactive game show where a group a room of founders sdrs bdrs aes managers sales leaders and all all the rest in between are put in front of a room of their peers where they have to not only the end you guessed it pitch their product so we have pre-selected one lucky winner who is going to come on down and who is going to make an attempt at pitching their product and pretend I'm the target customer and they're, they have the job of pitching me their elevator pitch. So let's go ahead and bring our lucky guest uh, from come on down on the stage. His name is Nick Hill Palvi. Nick Hill, go ahead and come off of mute, bring your camera back on and let's, uh, let's have a little fun here. <laughs> All right, there we go. Oh. So Hello thank you. and welcome, welcome, welcome to our game show, Pitch Your Product, live on How to Not Suck at Your Elevator Pitch with Startup Hype Man and Predictable Revenue. So Nick Hill, I'm going to put 60 seconds on the clock and you are, mm -hmm. you're going to pretend I'm your target customer. I okay. would like you to pitch me. Ready and go. So Rajiv, uh, we are a talent sourcing solution. Uh, we provide better remote developers to all sort of companies, like from startups to MNCs to uh, unicorns, all sort of uh, companies. We work with all bandwidths. So uh, what what I mean by better remote developers is that suppose you need a software engineer. When you put uh, the job posting on LinkedIn page or suppose your website, it usually takes a month to get the right talent to your company. And of course, it uh, it needs uh, it needs your efforts. It needs your money to uh, you need to spend your money on TA teams also. After that, when you hire that engineer, suppose his work is done, what will you do with him? You have to still like, if he's not working, you still have to give him salary. You have to give him health insurance benefits, all sort of things for zero and get plans. But what, and here is why our talent sourcing solution comes into picture. So the benefit to you, Rajiv, is suppose you hire a software engineer with us for three months of contract. First of all, you will get him onboarded within two weeks. He can start from and day one. And time is up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was hard. That was hard. That was good it's though. Tough, right? Good. Well, thank you, Nick Hills. And stay up here for a moment. Stay on our stage for a moment. Um, talk us, talk me through this for a second. You, you said it was hard. Um, tell, tell me, like, how did you feel while you were delivering that? You, you can bring your video back on. I, I, let's do a quick little like yeah, post-op chat here. How did you feel during that? Okay. So first of all, I, it was all of a sudden. I, <laughs> I'm first time meeting. I did not know how, how, what kind of person or how, what is your persona? So it was kind of hard and, uh, there was a time limit. So that is the most uh, part where I suck. So that is why yeah. I'm going to this webinar to influence that. Yep. All right. So not so, knowing the bias person, it, yeah. I guess. The, yep. If you were going to rank the it on a scale of 1 to yep. 10, what would you rank it as? Sorry? If you were going to rank your pitch there on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rank it? I'd give it six out of 10. <laughs> Shame on me. Six out of 10. All right. So let's say we give you the tools today to get it to mm -hmm. at least an 8 out of 10. Ideally a nine and best case scenario, we can get you to 10 out of 10 with the materials today. Does that sound good? Sure. Super All interested. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, you can go ahead and go head back to your seat, Nick Hill. Everybody in the chat, please give him a round of applause, either with emojis or asterisk, clap, asterisk, or whatever you got to do. Uh, like make it like an AOL chat room in 1999 and roll <laughs> dice accidentally by, by putting in the keystrokes for that. Anyway, so appreciate Nick Hill coming on for that. And uh, Sarah, could you just, could you just uh, make sure you mute him? Um, Absolutely can do. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye Nick Hill. So I want you all to just kind of take in what Nick Hill said there about how like, you know, he was worried. He didn't necessarily know like my persona. He was worried about the time limit, right? Didn't necessarily know what to say. And maybe when I said this whole pitch your product thing, you, you visualized yourselves being in his seat and having to do that. Maybe you didn't feel so great about it. Maybe you weren't so like eager to be like, oh, me, 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 pick me, pick me, pick me, right? Um, and and if, if that's how you are, I want you to say like, like, don't worry, you're not alone. I don't think that's good, but you're not alone. And we're going to talk <laughs> to how you can overcome that. And today, as we talk through how to not suck at your elevator pitch, I want to teach you this material through the lens of telling you the story about uh, someone else who is very much in your shoes. Uh, and he's the founder and CEO of a company named FanFood. His name is Carson Goodale and uh, a Chicago-based startup right out of Chicago, like where I am here. And a few years ago, 
he was in a, actually a very similar workshop to this. And afterwards he was like, uh, Hey man, like, honestly, like our pitch sucks. Like, can you help me? And I was like, yeah, I can help you. I think I can help you. Um, let's hear it. And so the first thing I did was I, I put a camera up over him and I said, all right, pitch me your company. And here's what he had to say. Fan Food is a mobile concession app that allows fans at live events to order concessions from their phone. They can choose to have it delivered to their seat or they can pick it up through an express line. The value add for the end user, the fan, is that we're going to maximize the user experience. The value add for the venue is that we're going to increase their revenues and the per caps. <laughs> right? it's a cool product though <laughs> cool product not a lot of energy in the it's pitch true. i mean y'all in the chat can say you know you can you can rank that out of 10 yourselves what, what would you give that i'd probably give it like a four myself um lacked energy um is very technical sounding mm, um, end user very much like yeah very yeah it's very yeah you talk about the end user right and Baseball he literally fan. said like <laughs> yeah <laughs> he literally said like the value is right, right. Um, and so those kinds of things, I'm like, okay, we got, we got to work on that. But I knew, you know, he knew in his heart, he's like, my team is capable of building something great. We got to get this part right. If we're going to be, if we're going to ultimately be able to scale. Cause like he knew like on his own, he's like, our product alone is not going to do it. We got to have the right messaging to go along with it. So he was like, I, I could really use your help becoming a great storyteller. Can you help me? I was like, yes. All right, let's do that. And as I mentioned, he was in a workshop very similar to this. And, um, the, what I mean, what I was able to bring to him as we started to work together was a very like eclectic and diverse background because I am someone who is very much like more than anything else I believe that everyone deserves a voice and I believe in the power of having a voice and that influences everything that I do but it very specifically influences how I come up with these strategies when we talk about uh, uh, your, your elevator pitch and your business communication and your messaging so if you're not familiar with me yet this is your first time uh, experiencing Raj Nation startup hype man. I want you to know that my background stretches across being a hip hop artist, a yoga instructor um, with startup hype man. Uh, aside from what you're seeing with like today, I'm also a professional announcer and MC. Yes, this is a photo of me from a couple weeks ago uh, as the ring announcer for an MMA fight, uh, a title fight, an MMA match, which is one of the coolest experiences I've ever had in my life, to be honest. Um, and, and then also I do a lot of work around messaging development pitch development. And I like to consider myself the chief pitch artist of Startup Hype Man. And that's kind of the perspective I take on this is, is how do we look at messaging like from an artist's lens? Okay. And what's been nice is uh, being, be, just being recognized in a lot of different places. Like I'm so thankful for Predictable Revenue for having me on today. I have also, um, you know, done a TED talk in the past. If you're interested in that, um, just Google my name, it'll show up. The talk was on vulnerability before Brene Brown made it cool to talk about vulnerability. <laughs> uh, I'm almost positive it did not hers did not come out before mine, and I had no idea who she was at that point. But um, yeah, I've just had a lot of like cool experiences, and I just show this to say like you know at least I'm not BSing you from in terms of like some uh, uh, where have I been and that kind of stuff. And it's been cool to take this experience literally across the globe. So I've worked with clients across almost 30 cities at this point, uh, multiple countries, multiple continents. And we've been able to use the strategies you're going to see today, as well as some strategies you'll see in the follow-up series, in the follow-up um, workshops in this series um, to, do, to do millions in sales, raise a whole lot of money as well, and win a bunch of competitions along the way. Now, if you don't think it's important because I'm saying it's important, let me introduce you to someone else. Um, this is Raj Bhargava, coincidentally, same first name. Um, I like to joke that he's like the Michael Jordan or the Tom Brady of entrepreneurship uh, because I like to think of like in startup land or in like business land, a championship is like either an IPO or getting acquired or exiting. And, uh, and, and like a good, like you, you got acquired for a good reason, not because you were like, you know, about to run out of money, but like, you know, your things were going well. And this other Raj here, um, I call him the Jordan or the, or the Brady of entrepreneurship because uh, no joke, he has, he's like, I think an eight time founder now with like four or five IPOs to his name, couple acquisitions. He's on the board of his seventh company and he's currently running his eighth company. 
He um, co-founded Techstars. He also co-authored a book called The Startup Playbook, which anyone who's watching this who's a startup, I highly, highly, highly recommend you read that book. Um, his first company was responsible for getting ESPN online. Yeah. Just think about that. They have a streaming platform now. His company back in the early 90s was responsible for putting them on the internet in the first place, which is just crazy. So super accomplished dude. And what I'm saying is if you don't take my word on like why messaging is important, take someone like his word for it because he's like, he's that well established. And what he told me when I met on my podcast a couple of years ago was he said, I think messaging is one of the most important things to focus on and it gets glossed over all the time. You have to say something that lights up a part of their brain. I think most companies fail at it. And that's probably why a lot of them actually fail overall. And guess what? If you don't want to take his word for it, Take this gentleman's word for it, Sean Amirati. He is a uh, professor of entrepreneurship at Carnegie Mellon. He authored a book called The Science of Growth. And he said, how you end up like a WordPress or a YouTube is you have your foundational elevator pitch extremely tight. It, is really, it is really is the core building block upon which you can build all the different communications important for your business. Um, Super accomplished person. He's an investor. He's an author. And that book as well, I think, is a great read, uh, The Science of Growth. What him and his Carnegie Mellon research team did was they looked at two companies with nearly identical products in identical markets. And they looked at, and they, they, they took a bunch of comparison examples and they said, what drove one company to scale and the other one to stall out? So like we all use YouTube. This is streaming on YouTube. But did you know there was another company that came out at the time called Rever? And he looks at why did YouTube succeed where Rever failed? And he's got several examples of you know, what, what were the elements that led one to scale and the other one to stall. And if you don't want to take his word for it, maybe at least take Kayla Weisberg's for it. She's an investor out of Chicago. And she says, story is everything. Without it, we cannot invest. So please, I, I want you to all just understand that this is important. And um, if you could just do me a favor in the chat, um, I would just like just put the cap, put it in caps lock or normal letters. I believe if, if you believe that figuring out your <laughs> elevator pitch is important and the, 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 the mantra, the refrain, I want you to sing in your head as you come out of today is that, can I, can I curse on this, Sarah? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, I want you to say to yourselves, my product does not mean shit without a compelling story. My product does not mean shit without a compelling story. Nice. All right. So if we're in alignment on that, Let's go ahead and continue forward with this. Maybe you're saying to yourself still, but you know what? I haven't been in an elevator in a year. Why would I need an elevator pitch? Uh, and what I, want to, what I want you to realize is similar to what Sean said in the quote on the previous page about, page about it being a building block, your elevator pitch unlocks a scalable narrative for your company. A scalable narrative is so key to company growth. Because what I observe is companies get by on a good product for a little bit. All of a sudden, they've got 50 to 100 employees. And then everyone in sales is saying something different. And they don't have a clue of what's the right path and what's the wrong path. And then every new person they add just muddies the waters more and more. So you want to have a scalable narrative. And uh, the framework I build scale scalable narratives under are what I call a story stack. So think about instead of a tech stack, it's your story stack. It's the different layers of messaging um, that your company leverages. The way you can visualize it, and I like to visualize it, is like it's your think of it as your mixtape. And what you see here are all the different tracks on your mixtape. And elevator pitch is basically like track number one. It sets the tone for the whole thing. And then you pop that mixtape into your boom box and it plays your company's sound loud and proud. That's what a scalable narrative does for your company. And you don't get that scalable narrative without first figuring out the elevator pitch. So that's why this is so, so, so important. Even if you've never actually, if you don't even plan to be in an elevator in the next, I mean, maybe now, but if you're still a little bit hesitant, which is fine. And you're like, I'm not going to be face to face with someone. Why do I need this? Understand it's more about, it's more than just about like that networking interaction. It's about how you present your company, whether it is utilizing it in a cold email strategy, or I always recommend with my clients when we're working on their demo calls, use your elevator pitch in your demo call to give them an upfront understanding of what your company can offer instead of like a five minute, like droning thing that then they're, and then you go into a demo. So you like, you, you confuse them up front, then you confuse them more with your software demo, tee up everything with the right elevator pitch. And then you'll see as well, like with a 
with your sales presentation, your pitch deck, really it's just an expansion on your elevator pitch. So that's why, again, it's so, so key to get this right. And I think as well, it's a key to get this right because what do we all care about at the end of the day? Money, right? <laughs> money, we wanna make money. If we're an SDR, if we're an AE, if we're the leader of the company, we want our companies to make money and grow. And if you wanna be a little bit more benevolent about it, think about money as impact, right? Think about money as economic development. Think about money as jobs, being able to hire more people, right? We all care about this. And Carson and FanFood, um, they were in that same boat, right? They cared about money, right? How do we make that revenue? How do we, how do we raise capital? How do we get our name out there the right way? That's what's on everyone's mind, but I know it can be tough to get there when you're feeling tongue tied. Maybe, and, and, and perhaps uh, Nick Hill, who's, who's backstage at this point, but Nick Hill can relate to this with what he was feeling when he was pitching up front in our little game show. Maybe you feel a little bit tongue tied and it's something similar to uh, this little um, ditty here from our friends over at the show, New Girl. The dog, uh, the dog, you put the food in the thing uh, and then the dog sees it and uh, <clears throat> food's dangling, dang, uh, it's dangling. Uh, dog, 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 Dog looks at dang dang tail wag wag uh, run. dog wag and the tag uh, whatever dog's name is dog's name is Claire Claire come in uh, Claire sees dog food pick Facebook like 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 sizzle and pick. Strategy. strategy sex, sex. Something. Something. something 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 this is the worst pitch <laughs> I have ever seen. <laughs> right, a little bit of an exaggeration, but That's I think so maybe good. maybe it's relatable. Uh, how do I get my presentation back? Let's uh, let me figure that part out. Also, All are right, you sharing your screen right now? Yes. Did it, oh, it. it didn't show. Oh, well, there was video. Well, to go I, along well, with I heard it, and it was funny anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> in any case, uh, all right. So now you can you can see this. Again, I cannot right? see your it's screen at all. All right, we're gonna we're gonna stop share and we're gonna bring it back. Okay. Oh, it like jumped up there. Okay, try again. Is it there? Uh, now it should be there. Yeah. Yes, we're there. Okay, perfect. There was a video to go along <laughs> with that, but you heard the audio and that's enough. Um, you know, maybe that's what a lot of people feel like, and a lot of the teams that I speak with, that's where they're at. You know, some version of maybe not to that extent, but some version of just like not getting out the right message. So we know, like we we know we care about that end goal of like making the dollars, making that economic impact, creating revenue, um, and we know it's important, but we're still feeling tongue tied. So what is it that's holding everyone back? Well, um, it is something that I call the messaging treadmill. And the idea here is I have talked with over a thousand company leaders over the last few years, and um, they have all come back with very specific reasons on why this is challenging. And I like to think of it as a treadmill effect where it's like they know it's important, but whenever they make an effort to work on it, it's like one step forward, they take one step back. And, and the one step back is for one of these three reasons. Um, so across those you know thousand or so conversations, um, the top three reasons that have come out are being too in the weeds of your own company to think about how would you talk to this, talk about this to someone who's never heard about it before. Um, being too technical minded. So maybe um, you know the product really well, but you're not necessarily thinking about like the communication of the product. Those are two different skill sets. And then number three is being too caught up in the day to day, um, just being pulled in like a million other directions. So it's really hard to sit down and think about like the messaging strategy behind all of this. Uh, and I'm just curious uh, if you could throw in the chat, everybody, um, which one of these reasons resonates with you? One, two, or three, just put the number that most resonates with you. Um, and then the crazy thing is, is like, um, for those of you who are like company founders, like all of this only gets compounded by the fact that it's entrepreneurship. Um, and there's just like this mental roller coaster that you're going on every day where you have like a million emotions and uh, you know the emotions a normal person would have over like a year you have in a single day, where you know it's like seven a.m. You're like, okay, I feel good. Nine a.m. A customer complains, you're like, okay, well we're broke, we're done. Eleven a.m. You get a new inbound, you're like, okay, I think we're gonna be fine. One p.m. An investor reaches out and they're pissed. And you're like, what was I even thinking, right? And this happens every single day, again, again, and again. And and that can be really tough to like think about how do we present our company even. So Carson was stuck on this treadmill. 
and he was leaning heavily towards reasons one and three being too in the weeds and too caught up in the day to day. So I said, okay, well, let's slow things down and let's reframe how you think. And with that, um, I, the first lesson I taught him was the right mindset to have. And the right mindset is I said, stop thinking like an executive, stop thinking like an entrepreneur, stop thinking like an SDR, stop thinking like an AE, stop thinking like a, 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 a CEO, CMO, et cetera. And I said, instead, I want you to think like an entertainer. Now, why think like an entertainer? Because an entertainer is concerned with one thing. How do I make my audience feel something? How do I get an emo- how do I create an emotional connection with them? How do I move them? Think of your favorite music. Sarah, who's your favorite musician? Oh my goodness, uh, Hosier. Who? Hosier. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take me to church. It was like a, a big, oh, yes, big slap like yes. three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So no, I, lo- I actually, I frequently like jokingly sing that song to myself. <laughs> <laughs> like I'll be like, take me to like, I'll really exaggerate the take I love part. That. <laughs> okay. Hosier. Hosier. Yeah. Okay. So let's say like Hosier takes the stage. What doesn't happen is Hosier doesn't take the stage going like, all right, how's everyone doing tonight? And everyone's like, yeah, we're great. Okay, great. So check it. Listen up. Um, tonight, we're going to play every song in our entire catalog, not just the hits that you're familiar with, but also like the B-sides and like cover to cover every track across like, you know, our four or five albums. It's going to be like 70 songs in total. We also want to cover some of those working drafts that we've been doing in our garage. We're not finished yet. We're not sure if they sound great, but it's really important to us. And we want to make sure that you hear it. Not, don't care if you care about it, but it's really important to us. We really want to get it all out in front of you. Who's with me? <laughs> Sarah, would you be like, I'm down for this 45 hour ride? Or would you be like, uh, like maybe I, I need a new favorite I artist. need to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, and you will be like, okay, well, I got to get home. I got I to eat. <laughs> I need I to wash family, my hair right? tonight. Yes, exactly. Right. The entertainer has their set list that they curate, right? They, or they create off of. And the set list is what guides them. And they, they curate that set list saying, how do we make the best connection with them? How do we get them buzzing about something? Right. And having a set list does allow for the random guitar solo, or if it's like a rapper, like freestyling on the spot. Right. But it, they know what they're working off of. And that's what you're trying to do here with your elevator pitch is like create your set list, so to speak. Right. So the, the musician will not play every song in their catalog. An actor will cut lines out of their script if they don't feel like it's fulfilling the larger story they're supposed to get across. If it takes away from the feeling they want their audience to have. So I want you to think like an entertainer. And let's take a lesson from another entertainer who has sold out many arenas over time. And that is one of my favorite rappers, uh, Jay-Z, a.k.a. Beyonce's husband. Um, <laughs> and about 18 years ago, he had a song where he compared himself to, at the time, they were less well-known underground rappers by the names of Talib Kweli and Common Sense, or Common Sense also goes by Common. And Jay-Z said in his song, I dumbed down for my audience and doubled my dollars. If skills sold, truth be told, I'd probably be lyrically Talib Kweli. Truthfully, I want to rhyme like Common Sense, but I did five mil. I ain't been rhyming like Common Sense. And so what he's saying here is, hey, I actually, like my product has all the bells and whistles. I have all the features and I could talk to you about all the features and all the bells and whistles. But I realized if I really wanted to make it big, if I really wanted to break through to the mainstream, I had to meet my audience where they were. And the second I did that, that's when I doubled everything, right? And I did 5 million sales on a single album and I haven't turned back since. And that's the mindset I want all of you to adopt is like, it's not about talking about all about what your product does and what it, what it has and playing up all your features. It's about making sure you can meet your audience where they are. It's about making sure that you, above all else, prioritize making that emotional connection with them. Um, another way to uh, depict this that I really love, it's this graphic I plucked off a user onboard website, uh, is Super Mario. You have the small Mario, that's your potential customer, and the flower, that's what you sell, or that's your product. You combine those two things together, you get big Mario on fire, shooting fireballs, killing bad guys, or the awesome person who can do rad shit. That is what you're selling, the awesome person who can do rad shit. 
but most companies are selling the flower. The flower doesn't matter if it is not tied to a better state that you're taking them to. So you got to deliver the version. You got to deliver the version of your audience to them of them being on fire, shooting fireballs, killing bad guys, jumping over Koopas and defeating Bowser's. So ultimately the lesson here with think like an entertainer is see and speak from your audience's point of view. See and speak from your audience's point of view. So that was the mindset I had to instill with Carson and fan food right out of the gate. Think like an entertainer. Once we adopted that mindset, then we said, all right, let's talk about how we put this together in an actual elevator pitch. And the first step towards that, I, I, to, to talk about the elevator pitch, I want to just cover real quick, like what I think is quite honestly, probably like the best elevator pitch example I can think of. And you may think this is pretty crazy, but the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the theme song of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Now, Sarah, if you, you didn't know this when you agreed to do this series <laughs> with me, but um, uh, this is also a sing-along concert. So yes. would you care Would you care to join me as we sing the Fresh Prince theme song together? Oh my God, okay. I only know and, the uh, first it, little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then all you in the chat, I want you on your side of the world, I want you singing this. Uh, you know, I don't care if your neighbor's like confused or if your dog looks at you funny. <laughs> I want you singing this on your side as well. So let's go. A one, two, a three. Now this, this is, is a story, story all about how, how my life got flipped, flipped turned upside down. down. I'd like oh, to take a minute, just sit right there. I'm sorry, how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air. Dun, 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 dun. In West Philadelphia, <laughs> born and raised on the playground is where, where I, I spent most, most of my, my days. days. Chilling out, max and relaxing, all cool and all shooting some b-ball outside of my school when a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in my neighborhood. I got in one little fight and my mom got scared. She said, you're moving with your auntie and uncle in Bel Air. All right. <laughs> thank you for holding space for that. And Love thank that. you everybody, everybody watching live for, for uh, being in tune with that. And I hope you sang along on your side as well. Um, this is great storytelling in action. This is having a great pitch. This is this is it, right? Because if you really dissect the lyrics of that song, what is Will Smith saying? He's saying, hey, I had this really rough upbringing in Philadelphia, and there was a really good chance that if I stayed there, I was going to get involved in a lot of trouble and a lot of riffraff, and it wasn't going to end out well. My mom recognized this early on, and so she realized the only way for me to truly fulfill my potential would be to send me packing over to Bel Air, California, so that way I could be surrounded by the right education system, the right uh, family structure and have the right access to resources so that ultimately I could grow into the man she knew I was capable of becoming, right? That's what the song is conveying. And that's what tees up every episode of the show, right? Because you know that introduction, you can watch episode one, but you could also watch episode 101. And you'll have a baseline idea of the plot. If you had never heard or seen that introduction and you watched an episode, you'd spend that entire 30 minutes trying to piece together what's going on here. But the elevator pitch does its job of offering the right amount of information of teasing the larger story. Your elevator pitch should do that. It should tease the larger story of your company. Another way to think about it is like, it's your movie trailer, right? And people don't see the movie if the trailer is bad unless it has Dwayne The Rock Johnson in it, my <laughs> homeboy on, on the book over here, uh, unless it has The Rock in it, in which case we will see it because it's The Rock. But uh, my muscles like deflate in comparison to his, so I, don't, I, don't, I can't get away with that. Uh, and I think most of us can't either. So um, that's why, you know, like, that's what, that's what the purpose of your pitch is to do. It should, it should tease out the further story, which is going to be getting them to agree to a meeting, or if you're on a demo already and use your elevator pitch, it's to tee up the, the larger product demonstration, right? It's to give that context up front. So how do we get there? The first thing we need to do before we create the tactical pitch is figure out our market positioning. And to do that, I've developed a strategy that I call the superhero positioning strategy. Now, the idea behind this is you have to look at your company as a superhero. You got to look at your product as a superhero. Because what do superheroes do? They help and they save people from something, right? And what does your company do? What does your product do? You help and you save a certain subset of the market from something they're experiencing. And I like to look at like Batman as an example for this because 
he didn't actually have any like cosmic ability. He was someone who combined access to capital with technology to serve the public good. Does that sound familiar? We all, right? We, with our products, with our services, we combine access to capital with technology and we serve the public good. Um, so if we think about Batman, um, in the chat, you can let me know. And then Sarah, in the meantime, while people are pulling it up in the chat, um, uh, Sarah, when you, like when, what's generally speaking, what's going on that makes Batman like put on the cape and swoop in and save the day? Something not good is happening in the city. Yeah. His beloved Gotham. And Her. he wants to help. Exactly. The bank is being robbed, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> Joker's blown up the hospital. There's someone's getting mugged. There's crime in the streets, right? All of those things are why Batman puts on the cape and comes in. What you don't see, if it's a sunny day, it's a perfect day. People have their kids at the park. They're taking their dog for a walk. They don't have a care in the world. Batman does not come in and say, swoop in and go, whoa, we're going to save you. <laughs> Just doesn't do it. Because if he did, I always say Lego Batman might do that because the Lego Batman has the ego issues if you've seen those movies. Uh, but the actual Batman wouldn't do that because if he did, you know how the people would react? They'd say, uh, who are you? Why are you wearing that creepy cape? Stay the hell away from my children. They had get the exact opposite impression of Batman. And that's what I see so many companies do. They try to swoop in and save Gotham on a sunny day. Hmm. They give their pitch and they say, we are an AI platform that delivers best in class uh, IT security administration with the, with the best uptime and we service all markets and we do, you know, and we serve enterprise all the way down to, to, to small companies. We've got employees on site. We've got this and this and this, right? They, they try to save Gotham on a sunny day. They save Gotham when Gotham doesn't need saving. So you should not do that because if you are Batman, you got to figure out a way to make Gotham need like a Gotham that needs saving first. So the, the superhero positioning strategy says that in order for a superhero to exist, your company, your product, there have to be three things in place first. You have to have a person in distress combined with a village on fire. When you have those things, then a superpower can be activated of yours, which then allows you to da, 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 swoop in and save the day as the superhero. Or in business speak, your target audience the core problem they are experiencing, your approach to that problem, and ultimately your solution, how you solve it, your product, what you do. This framework here is so fundamentally and vitally helpful towards figuring out not just your, I mean, definitely your elevator pitch, but all of your messaging from there. That's why, again, that's why I say, like, we talk about the scalable narrative. That's why elevator pitch comes first, because it all just builds up from there. And what does the elevator pitch uh, build out of? Figuring out the position. So if you're doing this on your own, piece of paper, four columns, just bullet point out your answers underneath each of these. Don't worry about how it sounds right now. Just get the ideas out of your head. It's an internal reference document only. The reason why you really want to do this is because by emphasizing the target, the problem, the damsel in, or dude in distress and the village on fire, what you are effectively doing is allowing yourself to, to get into a communication mode where you provide context and frame of reference, but most importantly, you lead with empathy. And empathy is so, so, so key to this entire equation. You get yourself on, the, you get yourself on their side before you talk about what you do. Remember when Jay-Z said, I met my audience where they were, right? I dumbed down for my audience, right? So you get yourself on their side first before you talk about whatever it is you offer. And so, in uh, with uh, you do this first, and then this allows you to create your elevator pitch. And so this is what we did with FanFu, with Carson and FanFu. We first created this, and then that allowed us to walk into the elevator pitch. So now, you know, the, the big reveal, right? You've all been waiting for what, what is the elevator pitch? So I'm going to hit you in a second with the simplest yet most deadly powerful formula you will ever come across when it comes to communication. And I call it very simply, K-Pasa. 
your K Pasa elevator pitch. In the chat, if you know Spanish, tell me what K Pasa means in Spanish. Sarah, do you know what K Pasa means? Means like what's Being happening? Being Canadian, you may not know it as well. <laughs> oh, wait, what'd you say? What's happening? Like what's going on? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you got it right. Yeah, yeah. What's happening or what's up? Okay. And that's what you have to do when it comes to your elevator pitch. You just got to tell people what's up with the business. K Pasa. The acronym here is P A S A, which represents problem, approach, solution action problem approach solution action problem approach solution action problem approach solution action we do me will you indulge me sarah for a moment and let's Absolutely. just say it together problem oh problem. i started before you all right, all right. Okay, ready? okay okay ready yeah problem, problem. approach approach solution. solution action action let's do it two more times okay problem, problem. approach approach solution, solution. Action. Action. I think there's a bit of lag, but I'm sure it's at the same time for everyone else. <laughs> Problem. Problem. Approach. Approach. Solution. Solution. Action. Action. Oh, we were like right on point. We were right on line on that last nice. one. That was good. So, okay. Now combine me saying it, us saying it together, and then individually, it's like 12 times it's been said. So science says you're more likely to, to remember this now. Problem, approach, solution, action. This works so, so, so well. Why? Because, again, context and frame of reference before anything else, but you lead with empathy. You say, hey, I understand the way things are today. I get it. That sucks. I totally feel that. That's why we're doing something about it. And here's what we have to offer. Let me uh, break this down a little bit more, because usually the first question that I get on this is, what's the difference between approach and solution? Think of approach as your ultimate value or your ultimate brand promise. Solution is like the descriptor of that. It, it is like the description of the product and, 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 and the benefits it provides. Action is your call to action. Um, so what do you want them to do? And that's gonna always be like situation dependent. So if it's a cold email, your action step is gonna be, um, depending on your cold emailing strategy, either to request a meeting or to ask if they're interested. If you're on a demo call and you're using this, again, to tee up that demo, your action here would be like, do you feel you have a good high level overview of how we help? Yeah, okay, great. Let me expand upon that a little bit more. And then you go into the next, you go into your demo, right? Um, it, this is a great formula for your homepage. You can map out your entire landing page using this formula. And in that case, your action step would probably be click to request a demo or click to book a meeting or click to, to learn more. If you were in person, it'd be kind of weird to finish your statement with, so click to learn more, but you might want to ask a question there like, has that ever happened to you, right? Something like that to get them talking. Problem, approach, solution, action. K okay, pasa. So let's go ahead and look at some examples now of K pasa in action. Are you ready for that, Sarah? I'm ready. All right. So first, let's look at a company. Uh, they go by the name of Avana. They are an Australian company. They're a, a well-being marketplace platform out of Australia. Um, they were going to market uh, initially, and they were they had just hired their first salesperson, and they were looking at all right, how do we break through in the market? Because the, uh, they actually had a bunch of different um, target audiences, being a, a, a marketplace platform. Um, so what we were able to do with Kpasa. They have a lot of like well-being practitioners who leverage their software. 19 different practitioners, in fact. Now that's a ton of target audiences, right? Mm -hmm. So what we did was we applied the K-Pasa formula and we said, okay, let's align these, let's align these different markets based on problem type. And we said, okay, you know what? The podiatrists are having the same problem as the, as, you know, whatever, the massage therapists. And so we grouped them based by problem type. And then we created K passes off of that, which allowed us to take 19 different markets and whittle it down to like five, I believe. One of their audiences, one of their largest audiences was chiropractors. And so they hired, they had their first sales hire and they wanted to make sure this person was set up to do well, to be able to hit the phones, 
um, call up the call up these chiropractors, get them interested, and get them to want to uh, 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 use the platform. And so, their pitch, their KPASA pitch, looked like this to the chiropractors: problem. Hey, we talk to chiropractors every day who tell us their schedule just has one too many openings. Their website doesn't generate enough leads. It's hard to stand out, and they want a few more patients to feel better about their practice month to month. Avana helps you fill the white space on your calendar. Use Avana to get new patients who can easily find and book your available time slots. You focus on treating them and let us focus on getting them in your diary. Australian companies, they use diary and calendar interchangeably. Get started at avana.com.au. And that's like a generic action statement, but I think you get the point. Mm-hmm. Now, can you see with this, like, like, Sarah, do you have a pretty decent understanding of what they do as a company? I do. And the I do. the value they offer to chiropractors. And you're not Certainly. even a chiropractor. Certainly. Yeah. <laughs> right? I can relate. I don't think you are. You're like, you don't moonlight as a chiropractor, <laughs> do you? <laughs> no. So, right, it's, it's a very natural flow of information. Problem, approach, solution, action. I mentioned earlier, approach is like that brand promise you deliver. So notice here, it's just like a convenient, quick one-liner. Hey, we help you fill the white space on your calendar. Solution, here, here's how we go about that. And what was awesome to see how successful they were using this pitch and then the other ones that we made under the k formula for their other target audiences, because that rep was able to come in and onboard 120 plus practitioners every month through his first six months. And their acquisition cost was significantly under budget, which was great. Wow. We also were able to use this and apply it to, uh, apply the k formula in a different way to a specific target audience of theirs. They had an opportunity to um, to uh, present to the biggest health insurer in the country um, for a white label uh, back end offering uh, solution, and we we uh, we looked at that company and we created a KPAS off that, and then we used the remember building block right foundational structure. We we created a pitch deck for that company based off of that KPAS. And they were able to walk in, like a relatively early stage company, walk in and have a meeting with the CEO and their team. And they walked out with that CEO saying, this is great. You really understand our company. Um, I'm really excited. And they walked out with a letter of intent from them. Right? I'm telling you, this stuff works. Let's look at another company, SearchSpring. They operate in the e-commerce retail industry. Okay, uh, I'll tell you, um, when I initially met with SearchSpring, they told me, we are like we sell through demos and it's horrible we're always caught in a feature battle we always get you know like bartered down on price uh and and they always just want to know like do we do this one thing or another but they had this like inclusive product suite and they were getting piecemealed a lot and so we did a lot with them right we did the elevator pitch but we used that to then create their pitch deck we used that to influence their cold email campaigns etc etc and Here's what the new search spring elevator pitch looks like. So this is what they are using as part of their email sequences, but also um, it's what they're saying on their demo calls to tee up you know, the larger walkthrough. And they're saying, hey, we, ch- we talk to e-com teams every day who tell us they're spinning their wheels trying to get their site to work the way they want it to. The search bar will pull up incorrect items and it doesn't account for spelling errors. And merchandising is a manual pain that takes up 10 plus hours every week. Search Spring gives you total control over your site so that it looks and acts exactly the way you want without your team taking on the heavy lifting. That level of control allows you to boost conversion rates through better search, merchandising, and personalization where you deliver the right product to the right shopper at the right time. And you get those 10 hours back every week. I'm going to explain this further now, through our demo now, but does that give you a good high-level understanding? So I will ask you, Sarah, does that give you a good high-level understanding? Yeah, absolutely. Right? And it's so, you should see how it changes the quality of the conversations they have, hmm. especially when they're in a highly, highly competitive market and they have a lot of other competitors who charge a lot less than them, actually. Hmm. And this helps make their demos a different conversation and a different call altogether because the other competitors are bludgeoning them over the head with a software demonstration. And they don't have a succinct way to present the company up front first. 
So we use this formula. And again, right, the approach here, the promise, the ultimate promise we deliver is that you're going to get total control over your site. And here's how we do that. So the results with them were pretty awesome. And like I mentioned, right, elevator pitch can, is like a building block to the entire messaging, to the entire story stack. Well, we were able to take that and, and um, like if you go to their homepage now, you'll see this, this message, gain control over your shopper's experience, right? So that messaging now is influencing what they put on their website. How did it influence their demos? Well, this is uh, Steven here. And um, this was earlier this year. He said, March was the best month of my career. I closed 195% of quota. Nice. Then in April, he did 200%. And then in May, he did 105. His drop-off month was doing 105%, <laughs> right? Because we got the messaging down right, and the messaging then influences the demo cadence and the conversation structure changes. And then not just him personally, but the entire sales team. Uh, what was the other result they had? Well, this is their CEO, Peter, taking a pie to the face because he bet the sales team they could not hit their quarterly goal. And they and he said, if you beat that goal, I will take a pie to the face. And uh, they beat it so bad that he took a pretty, well, there's a pie to the face. You can see she grabbed the neck and made sure he couldn't yeah. pull away. <laughs> so that, so all of you who are on this who are ahead of sales, that could be you pieing your, because she's the VP of sales there. So if you want to give your CEO a pie in the face, this can be your ticket towards doing that. And then let's come back to our friend Carson and FanFood, who I was talking to everyone about originally. What does their pitch look like? Well, we applied the K-Pasta formula and I've worked on so many pitches over the years. And this was, on, this was one of the first ones I did. And to this day, it's still probably my favorite one. Here's what they're, and remember what, remember what you heard before. Here's what it became. As a diehard sports fan, there's nothing more frustrating than going to your favorite team's game and missing the big play because you were stuck waiting in line for a hot dog and beer. Fan food keeps you in the moment. Use our mobile ordering app and get your concession food delivered directly to your seat so you never miss a big play again. Download fan food in the app store today. Sarah, do you of understand 10. what they do? Yeah. There you go. There's Absolutely. that 10 out of 10 right? It's so easy to understand what they do and the value they provide. Mm -hmm. All the technical jargon has been stripped out of it, right? There's no the value to, there's no the end user gets, none of that. It is spoken to a sports fan in the way the sports fan would want to hear it. And this works so well. I have been with Carson when he has delivered this pitch, like in front of a room of people, and he's had people stop him. Like, like I was there one time, someone stopped him mid-sentence to say, that was me, that was me, the Odell Beckham catch, the, the Odell Beckham catch, the greatest catch in NFL history. I was sitting in the end zone that he caught that catch in, but I had gotten up to go get my beer and I was in line, I'm not kidding, for 30 minutes and I missed the catch because of that, All right? And that's how you know you have struck a chord with them. And I want to point out a couple other things with all of these examples that I've shown you so far. Um, notice how the bulk of the pitch is spent building up the problem. Because the better you can articulate the problem, the easier it is to describe the solution and the less you have to actually say about, about the solution. Because the, the, the beauty of this K-PASA formula is that when the problem is well articulated, they are already in their head starting to make an assumption about what the solution is. So by the time you speak your solution, the, instead of it being like new information for them, it's almost like it's a reinforcement of a thought they've already had. So now it actually feels like it's something that they thought of, not something that you pitched them. So it's kind of like a Jedi mind trick you're able to pull where it feels like it's their pitch and not yours. And my dad always says this, and he, he's an engineer. He's not by no means a messaging marketer, salesperson or anything like that. And I think it's a great lesson. Um, a problem, uh, he says, a well-defined problem is already half solved. A 
a well-defined problem is already half solved. So you can define that problem well. Again, you don't have to go into every last detail about what it is you do. So let's talk about like the power of a great pitch. Well, that's what fan foods pitch became. Can Carson deliver it better? Let's take a look. And uh, I hope that the uh, audio, if, if you don't hear audio on this, just uh, flag me and let me know. Okay. I can hear it. Hey there. My name is Carson Goodell, CEO and co-founder of Fan Food. Now, as a diehard sports fan, there's nothing more frustrating when you're at your team's game than missing a big play because you were stuck waiting in a line for a hot dog and beer. Fan Food keeps you in the moment. Our mobile ordering app brings concessions directly to your seat, so you never have to miss the big play. Now, we are currently live in five venues in three different states, our two largest being a major league soccer venue and the Formula One Raceway down in Austin, Texas. Download our app today on the iOS and Android store. Swagger. Yes. Confidence. He even does a little at the end. The Love first that. video he said, he finished with, okay, that's all I've got. Yeah. This one, he's like, you know, he's got he that, feels that, it. that step, that drip to him. And it makes sense, right? That's probably the most important thing. So what were kind of fan foods results with this? Well, um, they, uh, that block should be transitioning later. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> so out of the gate, you know, they were able to raise some money out of it, which was great. They, they won a thousand bucks in a pitch competition and they won 25,000 bucks. Then they got a, that led to a, a strategy meeting with Damon from Shark Tank. They had a successful crowd fund. They raised a $3 million round after that. And then they scaled their team to 30 plus. And now they've got customers in the NCAA, Major League Soccer, Minor League Baseball, Major League Baseball, Formula One, uh, so much more. And what I really love about this formula and how much it helps is it really helps influence like decision making as well. Because being a live event based company, you can imagine that last year might have been pretty troubling for them with no live events. Um, but this commitment to the problem helped influence the decision making. So when all this happened, they made an immediate pivot because they said, okay, well, the problem we solve is lines. Where else could there still possibly be lines? And they pivoted to hospital cafeterias hmm. because what's the last thing you want during the height of COVID is hospital workers you know, having to congregate and wait for their food. Hmm. And then they said, okay, well, what's still open? Golf courses, all right. Let's, let's go to golf courses and do uh, mobile delivery for golf courses. Drive-in movie theaters, right? They looked at any possible place where lines could still be forming and they went there. And then they cool. even expanded into doing a little bit of a, like restaurant, uh, like mobile ordering menu stuff as well. And the coolest thing that I think about their story is that when we were working together a few years back, I'm not kidding, we were sitting back, they had a couple customers at that point, but they were, they were pretty early. And we were like daydreaming about like, wouldn't this be awesome, you know, being Chicago based to get in to get in with the Chicago Cubs. Opening day this season, fan food was there. Wow. How Which cool. I just think like, I, I cannot express how like proud I am of them for being able for, for getting to that point. And ultimately, I just want to share just a couple final things here. Um, and this is what, if you, again, if you didn't believe me with the importance of this, or you didn't believe the other, uh, you know, uh, reputable people believe Carson then where he said, Hey, one of the most underrated skills as an entrepreneur is authentic storytelling. Developing this skill without a doubt has made me a stronger entrepreneur and, um, where I can, um, cap this. I know we're right at time. If you want, I, I a couple of years ago for his birthday, I made a rap. I, I gave him a little birthday rap. We yeah. can play that unless we're out of time. No, let's do it. People, people can drop off and come back and watch the recording if they absolutely have to go, but yeah, go for it. Okay. All right. So, let me know if the if you don't see a LinkedIn page pull up. Okay. Uh, are you seeing a LinkedIn page? No. All right. I'm gonna redo the screen share. Okay. I don't know why it doesn't like your screen share. I think because I'm like choosing to like share like one window and not uh, not like the uh, the whole the whole thing. Hang on. New share. Let's do this. Desktop. So now you should be able to see it. Yeah. No. <laughs> what? No, I don't know why. I want to help, but I don't know how. Hmm. Sad. Um, we saw the last stuff, no problem. How about this? No. Nope. Nothing? Nothing. What? Nothing. Oh. 
Really? Well, Weird. How come you were, you were able to just share? Oh, well. That's right, sad. Let's try it. Let's try it one, one oh, more time. Oh, there was like Not a little sure. flash. Try it again. Yeah, try stop. <laughs> stop and bring it back. Let's see. Yes. Sweet. Yes, Can you we're also there. See, like, the, the browser tabs up here too? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. So let's try this. Now I hope the audio pulled over as well. Uh, you have to I'm rapping add. about the damn dude behind fan food. Yeah, the man who does everything that you can't do. Wait, 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 wait. Let me start over. I don't like that. Yo, I'm rapping about the damn dude behind fan food. Yeah, the man who does everything that you can't do. That's true. Now peep him though, the CEO agreed to make a heap of dough, achieving it, you see the road, and dreaming big but sleeping no. And even though he's local now, believe in me, the team will grow and feed the meats at every meat. That's what I call hemoglobin. <laughs> Not done. Keep me flowing. Carson is here for the ship, so let's keep it rowing. An entrepreneur, they used to look at him like, dude, you want to be sure. The B student raised the Series A. Now they call him up like, I hear you getting paid. Selling into sports arenas? Huh. <laughs> Go and drink the hater raid. If you doubted him then, now, you ain't worth his data raid. He just turned 25. And what you're doing now, it could work, or, honestly, it could fail. But I prefer to be an optimist. So, Carson, I say we celebrate with, well, what else but a good ale. And that is the Carson fan food birthday Happy rap. birthday. Aw, nice. So in closing, everybody, and thank you for letting me share that. Um, yeah. In closing, uh, just quick reminder, don't miss the rest of the Try Not to Suck summer series. We're coming back at you July 29th with How to Not Suck at Personalizing Cold Email. So I'll show you how do you take this specific K-Pasta formula and apply it to strategic accounts where you want to send personalized outreach to. Uh, we're going to come back in August and talk through your demo call strategy. How do you structure a demo call to, have, to, to be successful? to have 200% of quota, 195% of quota, et cetera. And then we'll come back in September with sales presentations that don't suck. Just a quick disclaimer, we may change the September date to a different day that week or that month, but at least for now, it's September 24th. And that's what I got for y'all. So um, what I'm gonna send to y'all, there's my contact information, please connect with me on LinkedIn, send me an email if you got questions. If you wanna work on your elevator pitch, please reach out. Um, I'm going to follow up with an email where I will be sending you a quick like five minute video um, that just quickly summarizes and explains the K-PASA formula. And I will also share with that a, a kind of a partner resource that um, gives you a quick, just like PDF guide um, to help you start thinking about how you create one for yourself. Um, and then I think Sarah, this, this recording's on YouTube now and I believe Predictable Revenue will be sharing it out, yeah? Yes, correct. Perfect. Well, I had a ton of fun doing this. Uh, anything else we need, to, we need to share at this point, Sarah? I don't think so. I think that's it. That was really, really great. Honestly, I can I can understand why you have all of these various types of speaking engagements or like you you are a presenter, entertainer, communicator, all these things. It's been a pleasure. Um, I'm so that. excited to have the rest of the, the three weeks still to get to chat with you. Yeah, it's the, it's the summer of not sucking, everybody. Yes, we love that. <laughs> oh, no, this got all small. There we go. Um, Yep. Great. Thank you so much, Rajiv. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you to everybody who is live in the chat right now. So wonderful to have all these faces. Um, and if you want to be like Nick Hill was early in, in our session there, if you want to be able to join live and actually like have a conversation, get to speak to Rajiv live on the line, have him on your, his game at uh, the game show. The, the live game yeah. show, please let us know and we'll invite you. You absolutely can be here with us. We'd love to have you live to chat with us. So if that's something that you're interested in doing, please reach out to, you can either reach out to me on LinkedIn, you can shoot me an email at sarah at predictablerevenue.com or to our marketing team, at Veronica with a C at predictablerevenue.com and we will get you a seat live in the Zoom room so that you can be there with us. But other than that, thank you so much and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. And shout out to Nick Hill for being our uh, game show contestant. I hope you got the material today to bump from that 6 out of 10 to a 10 out of 10. Yeah, absolutely. Raju, Thank you. First oh. of all, that was that was pretty much helpful session for me. And the next time we meet, I will make sure like you hear my elevator pitch and get 10 on 10 for that. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Great. So thank, thank you.